Thank you so much. I know it's a long afternoon and we wanted to get everything covered, so I um, appreciate you guys hanging in there. Um, our last panel is going to be on national security and public safety. Um, as you may have been aware, uh, Secretary Nielsen has been on the Hill this morning testifying and as of a few hours ago, she was still there. So she's going to be unable to um, join us today. But we do have um, Sue Gordon um, in her stead. Um, she's the Principal Deputy Director of DNI, um, the Director of National Intelligence. Um, so she'll be able to come up here and talk about some of the um, stuff that she's pursuing. Um, and so with that, I'm going to introduce uh, Jessica Ditto, who is a Deputy Communications Director, and she'll be moderating this panel, along with Heather Wilson, who is the Secretary of the Air Force, um, Rachel Brand, the Associate Attorney General, and Sue Gordon, the Principal Deputy Director of DNI. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here and thank you to everyone who's tuning in on C-SPAN and YouTube and those of you in the audience. Um, it's not every day that you get to follow the president on stage, so um, that's a lot of pressure for me. Um, but let's first start by giving a round of applause to our first panel discussions. These incredible women covered so much ground on issues so important to our country and really appreciate those of you who took your time to be here today. Let's just give a round of applause to the first group of panels that we've had. We have a diverse group of women from a wide variety of communities across the country on stage to discuss an issue of top concern for women and frankly all Americans, national security and public safety. It's our pleasure to have Arkansas Attorney General Leslie Rutledge here with us as part of this group to engage in this important discussion today. Welcome. Now it is my honor to introduce three more leaders of the Trump administration to talk about the many ways we are addressing the national security and public safety concerns of our nation. Heather Wilson, Secretary of the Air Force, Rachel Brand, Associate Attorney General at the Department of Justice, and Sue Gordon, the Deputy Director of DNI. Thank you, Sue, for being here with us. <laughs> Secretary Heather Wilson of the Air Force leads 660,000 active duty guard, reserve, and civilian forces, as well as their families. And she oversees the Air Force's annual budget of more than $132 billion. Prior to joining the Trump administration, Secretary Wilson was the first female military veteran elected to a full term in Congress, and most recently was president of the of South Dakota School of Mines and Technology. Secretary, thank you for being here. We welcome your remarks. You may, you may start. Well, thank you so much, Jessica. I, I just wanted to perhaps start out by mentioning a few things. Um, it was actually 27 years ago today that the United States Air Force kicked off Desert Storm uh, after, uh, after Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. So 27 years ago today. I was actually at the time a young staff member on the National Security Council staff in the building right next to us here. In the ensuing 27 years, the United States Air Force has been continuously involved in combat operations for 27 straight years. And on this day 27 years ago, we had 134 fighter squadrons in the United States Air Force. Today we have 55. Last year, with last year's budget submission, uh, the President's budget submission started to turn the corner to restart, tar, start to restore the readiness of the force and our ability to meet future threats. Um, we've got a long way to go to restore that capability to defend the country, but we're committed to do so. I look forward to, to your questions and the discussion that we have today. Thank you. Thank you. 
And now I'd like to introduce Rachel Brand, Associate Attorney General at the Department of Justice. She serves as, a, as the third ranking officer in the Department of Justice and oversees more than 15 offices and divisions, including the Office on Violence Against Women and the Service Members and Veterans Initiative. Welcome. Thank you for that introduction, and thanks to all of you for being here. It's a real honor for me to be on this stage with Secretary Wilson and Deputy Director Gordon, two of our strong leaders in, the, in our efforts to defend the homeland and uh, the national security. I'm going to talk about something a little bit different, which is protecting Americans from violence and crime. So public safety, like national security, is essential for us to enjoy all of the other rights and freedoms that we have as Americans and for economic prosperity to flourish and for really the government to carry out every, uh, every other mission that it has. So we at the Department of Justice are committed to really bringing down violent crime and combating a variety of other forms of crime. So I'm going to touch on three really quickly here and then I'm happy to take questions about uh, the other missions of DOJ. The first is violent crime. In 2015 and 2016, we saw a pretty dramatic increase in homicide rates and in general violent crime rates in cities around the country. So when Attorney General Sessions came into office uh, at the beginning of last year, he expressed his commitment to bringing those numbers down. The numbers for 2017 are too preliminary to know with any certainty yet, but the initial indications are that those violent crime rates have plateaued and may even be beginning to go down, and we're doing everything that we can to ensure that's the case. One of the ways that we do that is to express publicly that we stand with our state and local law enforcement officers. We believe in our men and women in law enforcement, and we're going to do everything we can to stand with them, both in terms of bringing cases against individual criminals and gangs, and also in terms of making sure they have the resources that they need where that's within our power. Another thing that we're doing is focusing on the worst of the worst violent offenders. A few criminals commit a disproportionate percentage of all violent crimes. And so if you can take them off the streets, you can really have a dramatic impact on communities and, and get them out from under a reign of, of terror of street crime. And so the Attorney General ordered all of our 94 U.S. attorneys' offices around the country to do just that, to work with state and local police and focus on the worst of the worst. Part of that focus is a gang known as MS-13, which many of you have, I'm sure, heard of in the press. This is a transnational gang that prides itself on using the most brutal, violent tactics possible to... Uh, commit its crimes. It also recruits members by for threats of violence and force. So oftentimes teenagers don't want to be in the gang, but they're forced to, to join the gang. Under AG Sessions' leadership, we prosecuted 1,200 gang members last year, and we brought, in general, vastly more charges of violent crime than we had in decades before at the Department of Justice. So I'll leave that, I'll leave that issue there, and I'm happy to take questions. The second, um, second issue I'd like to talk about actually ties into MS-13. And this is the issue of human trafficking. MS-13 is a drug trafficking organization, but it's also started to branch out into other criminal enterprises, including sex trafficking of girls. So I've been spending a lot of my own time on human trafficking and sex trafficking in particular. I think a lot of people are surprised to learn that this is a prevalent problem around the US. We hear about it from our US attorneys and from state and local police all over the country. Their victims are at truck stops, they're in cities, they're in depressed uh, rural areas, they're in high-end suburbs, they're at low-end motels in the Midwest, and they're at glitzy casinos on the Strip. It's everywhere. And it's, it's big business because the traffickers view their victims as a commodity that can be sold over and over and over. Unlike drugs, which can be sold once, you can sell a victim over and over and over. So I view this as a civil rights crisis. Uh, other people have called it modern-day slavery because obviously trafficking is something that happens to someone against their will. So this is another area where we are throwing all of our resources at it. Of course, we're bringing our law enforcement resources to bear, uh, prosecuting the traffickers. Part of this is really public education. Because if everybody from ER doctors to child protective services workers to flight attendants to casino workers know about trafficking and know how to spot the problem, then we can rescue more victims. And so we've been training industry, we've been training local law enforcement, which has had tangible results in terms of rescuing individual victims. For example, there was a state police officer in Georgia who, at a traffic stop, noticed a girl in the back seat and with a few well-placed questions realized that she was a victim of trafficking and was able to rescue her. That's what that kind of training can do. And then we're funding uh, victims services providers. This is not just the right thing to do. It is the right thing to do. I mean, a trafficking victim has a very long and hard road of recovery ahead of her if she's rescued. Victims need a lot of help. So funding services providers is the right thing to do from that perspective, but it also helps us carry out our law enforcement mission. Because if a, if a victim 
can be stabilized enough to participate in the prosecution of the trafficker, then we can bring more traffickers to justice. And then thirdly, I want to mention a new initiative that DOJ has to combat sexual harassment in housing, another type of sexual exploitation. Now, this, the word sexual harassment doesn't really capture what we're talking about here. This ranges from a landlord letting himself into a woman's apartment and assaulting her to giving her a choice between eviction and performing sexual favors. Like human trafficking, a lot of people are surprised by how prevalent of an issue this is, but we're seeing it uh, all around the country in all types of housing. And so in October, we launched an initiative at DOJ. Uh, it's our sexual harassment and housing initiative. We have a 1-800 hotline. We have a website, because we want people to know that nobody should have to make a choice between sexual abuse and a roof over their head. So we're getting the word out. We've already brought cases on behalf of over 40 victims, recovering over a million dollars for those victims. And we'd love to have your help in getting the word out about that problem and, um, and helping bring justice to more victims. So I'll leave it at that and hand it over to, to Sue. Uh, thank you. Yes, so my pleasure. Great. Allow me to introduce our third speaker. Uh, we have the Honorable Sue Gordon, who is the fifth Principal Deputy Director of the National Intelligence. She has spent her esteemed career serving our country and assist the DNI in leading the intelligence community and managing the ODNI. In particular, she focuses on advancing intelligence integration across the IC, expanding outreach and partnerships, and driving innovation across the community. With nearly three decades of experience in the IC, Sue has served in a variety of leadership roles spanning numerous intelligence organizations and disciplines. Ms. Gordon served for 27 years at the Central Intelligence Agency before that, rising to senior executive positions in each of the agency's four directorates. When we're discussing our national security and protecting our homeland, there's few who know more about this issue than Sue, so we're grateful to have you here as part of our panelists. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Jessica. I am uh, sorry that Secretary Nielsen isn't here because uh, I, I enjoy listening to her perspective, and you would have as well. Um, but I'm delighted to be here. So, I love I love the craft of intelligence. Um, it is to me one of the most fundamental of all American disciplines. I think of it as um, knowing the truth and seeing beyond the horizon and allowing our leaders to act before events dictate. Um, when you think of it, you most often hear of it in terms of counterterrorism or counterproliferation or regional instability, um, maybe cyber, cyber threats. Um, but, you know, one of the things that you probably don't hear as much about is our role in transnational organized crime or humanitarian and disaster relief. And if I think of the arc of my career and where the changes have most been in terms of how intelligence is participating directly with the American people, one of them is our partnership with state, local, tribal, bringing our history of awareness of what's going on in the world and making it useful um, for some of the domestic issues that we all face. Because Let's face it, this is a massively interconnected world. And now our ability to take the body of knowledge that we have acquired since 1947 and make it available through the other departments of the administration to law enforcement and to other activities is, I think, one of the great advances that we've made. But it's not just through government entities, but national security increasingly is the purview of the private sector. And so how do we partner with the private sector to be able to give them the insights they need in order to do their job. And again, partnering with DHS, with the FBI, in order to share our intelligence. Let me leave you with a couple things. Um, I think there is nothing more important than we can do is to have a conversation with the American people about what we do and why we do it. Um, transparency is so important. It's important to recognize that in our craft, it isn't a national security or privacy. It's a national security and privacy. And one of the conversations that we've recently had with you all is over a thing called 702, which is protecting our ability to be able to look at what's going on overseas and make it available so we can keep America safe. So when you think about our craft, and as we talk about this, I just encourage you to think of the arc of what intelligence provides 
and the manner in which it affects the day-to-day -day lives of Americans. As a woman, uh, when I started in 1980, I was in an office of 780 um, scientists and engineers, and there were two of us who were professionals in that 780. If you were to walk into that same office now, you would find the leadership is about 50-50. The people who are making the great advances, the interns we have coming in, so when we think about a discipline that is predisposed for diversity of thought, independent thought, big purpose, I think it is a discipline that we have seen has grown with the growth of women in the discipline. And so I'm especially delighted to be here with you. Thank you very much. Now we get to turn to our panelists uh, on stage with us and uh, take some questions. With that, I'll, I'm going to follow our press secretary's model and have each of you pass around the microphone and introduce yourselves to our guests. Thank you. Testing? Does, can you all hear me? We will start with our... All right, well, good afternoon. I'm Leslie Rutledge, Arkansas Attorney General. It's good to be with you all today. Good. I'm Suzanne Merrill, Utah, Republican Women's President, and a tr strong Trumper. <laughs> My name is Carolyn Bunny Welsh. I'm the Sheriff of Chester County, Pennsylvania. And just to let you know, there are 73 municipalities in Chester County. One of them is named Nottingham, so if you've read Robin Hood, I am the Sheriff of Nottingham. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm Kathy Swan, State Representative from Missouri, representing Cape Toronto in southeastern Missouri. Good afternoon, and thank you for having us all here. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to discuss women's values and women's issues. My name is Libby Zabo, and I'm from Colorado. I served in the state legislature for four years, and now I am a county commissioner in Jefferson County. It's the third largest county in the state of Colorado. Good afternoon. My name is Teresa Yan. I'm from Greensboro, North Carolina, and I'm a consultant for an education company there. Good afternoon. My name is San Wong. Um, I, I'm from Iowa. I'm the director of the Iowa Department of Human Rights. Good afternoon. I'm Linda Cavender. I'm from just outside Park City, Utah, and retired federal law enforcement. Good afternoon. I'm Michelle Fiore, representing fabulous Las Vegas, Nevada, as a councilwoman. And it's so great, and it's such an honor to be here serving uh, under a president who is making America great again. Well, with that, we'll go ahead and turn to our panelists for some questions. Who has, would you like to go first? Let's go ahead. So um, as our president campaigned and vowed to make America great again, he also vowed to increase military spending. And you kind of touched on it. And so I want, it's a two-part question that I have. And one is, where are we today with the readiness of if something were to happen? And where are we with funding in case of a global threat? Let me start and take that one. Um, I think all of us are concerned about the long-term readiness of the force, but I, I got to tell you that, uh, that uh, if the nation called the Air Force tonight, we would be there. That's the way airmen are. Yeah. Uh, if we have to fight tonight, we'll be there. The question on readiness for all of us is not whether we'll go. It's how many will come back. That's what low levels of readiness mean. And so, so our responsibility, and Secretary Mattis has been very clear, our, our number one responsibility is to restore the readiness of the force, to win any fight, any time, and allow our airmen, soldiers, sa sailors, and Marines to come home again. That's what we're trying to achieve. The President's budget uh, that he put forth um, for fiscal year 18 that we're already four months into or so um, starts to restore the readiness of the force and turn the corner. Um, but for the ninth year out of 10, we've started this year with a continuing resolution. 
And the Air Force is not going to, and the, the Department of Defense is not going to sequester ourselves. But we still live under a law called the Budget Control Act, where if there isn't, uh, if there is an agreement in the Congress to get beyond the Budget Control Act or to lift the defense caps, we would go through sequester. If we have a year-long continuing resolution at last year's levels, it is effectively sequester. When the, the Air Force had to go through sequester um, once before, and it was devastating to the force. Right now, we are short pilots, particularly fighter pilots, because the airlines are hiring, and they, they know where they get the best pilots from, and it's from us. If we go th through sequester, if we don't fit, figure out a way to get beyond this continuing resolution, um, we will have to, we will have no new starts for new programs. I won't be able to sign new contracts for things like additional munitions. Um, and uh, the pilot shortage will get worse because I'm under sequester. About a third of the Air Force would sit on the ramp and not fly for the last quarter of this year. So unless you're going to combat or spinning up to combat, you're not flying. Uh, that's devastating. And you can't recover from that can't say, well, we'll not fly from four, for four months and then recover from it in the next four months. It takes years to recover from a readiness setback like that. So the most important thing that we can do for the readiness of the force is to take this thing off of cruise control and get the Congress back to budgeting in a normal way and give us some predictability with respect to budgeting. Um, the President's budget that, that I think will be rolled out on the 4th of February or so will continue um, to restore the readiness of the force and cost effectively modernize the force to face the threats of the future. And I think the, the new national defense strategy will explicitly recognize that there are emerging threats that are not just violent extremist threats, uh, but threats from, from, uh, from nation states that we have to prepare for and we have to confront those head on. I'll just briefly add that intelligence is always at war. Um, and so everything Secretary Wilson said applies to the intelligence community that does everything it can to make sure that we have the most information to best prepare um, our women and men of the armed forces, but also the weapon systems that we need. So we reduce the uncertainty. What I find the impact of the 10 years that the Secretary mentioned when we were under budget uncertainty um, is that we must um, attend to the President and what we tend to steal is our future. You know, the investment in those things will make a difference going forward. I'm so excited about a national security strategy that lays out an objective against which I can show what we need to do in order to get there. Um, but it is a challenge. I think the budgets that um, uh, the President has submitted will help us in that direction. But it is a challenge when we don't have budget certainty to be able to, pre be able to prepare um, for the inevitabilities that unfortunately we have. All right, thank you. And that was such a, a timely question given the debate that's uh, raging on the Hill this week. And uh, thank you, Secretary, for laying that out for us. All right, who's next? Thank you. How does the policy of America First different from this administration to that of previous administrations? <laughs> we have a national security strategy now yes. within about a... <laughs> Within about a month or so, we will have a new national defense strategy and a nuclear posture review, which will then guide our budget submissions. Um, I, I would say that one of the key elements of that national defense strategy is working closely with allies and partners. Um, that uh, that uh, America first doesn't mean America alone. And we are actually stronger when we, when we have allies and partners with whom we can operate. Um, uh, and where we've got interoperability. We have a coalition today uh, that has been fighting ISIS in the Middle East, uh, destroyed ISIS. And it was a combination of exquisite intelligence combined with indigenous forces supported by American ground forces and some fantastic air power 
that destroyed ISIS. And I'd much rather that we play away games rather than play home games against ISIS. Um, we're very concerned about the sanctuary cities and that we know that our president needs to end those sanctuary cities and we are happy about that. But we also know there's mayors across the nation because these sanctuary cities create a tremendous amount of lack of safety for the states. And uh, especially naughty California wants to oppose the president and become their own sanctuary state. And we're very concerned, how is he going to handle that and not let that happen? Do you have any ideas? <laughs> let me take that one. Uh, we share your concern about sanctuary cities. The Attorney General has been in sanctuary jurisdictions, because as you say, it's not just cities, it's now states potentially. At least one state has already enacted legislation. You know, it's really, it's really baffling because what we're talking, the, the main concern here is illegal aliens who have committed crimes, criminal aliens, and many of these sanctuary jurisdictions prohibit their law enforcement from cooperating with federal immigration authorities and federal uh, law enforcement in general. Uh, and so if ICE, for example, the Department of Homeland Security wants to access a jail to potentially remove someone from the United States who's committed a crime, these sanctuary jurisdictions will say, no, we won't cooperate with you. We'd rather let that person go, a, a person who's committed homicide or some other serious crime, we'd rather let them go and cooperate with the Department of Homeland Security. So we are looking at all of our options. We're considering a number of things. One thing that I will mention, um, which is already public, is that the Attorney General has limited uh, DOJ law enforcement grants by saying if you're going to receive a DOJ grant, a condition of that grant will be that you don't do that anymore. I mean, it's, it's more technical than that, obviously, but that's effectively what what it does. Now, some of those jurisdictions then sued us, saying you can't do that, so now we're in litigation over that. But, but it is really, um, you know, it's really important that, that uh, federal immigration authorities have the ability to access state and local law enforcement and, and uh, correctional facilities to, to deal with that problem. So we're concerned about it too. Thank you. Uh, first, um, I want to say within one month after our president came into office, he invited 10 of the nation's sheriffs in to speak with him. And he brought us in not to talk to us, but to hear from us. And he wanted to know what were our concerns in our various jurisdictions and our counties and parishes and uh, states. In that room, there were nine men, um, North Carolina, Texas, Indianapolis, Indiana, and I was the only female sheriff. In fact, out of 3,020 sheriffs in the nation, there are only 38 women elected sheriffs. Um, I do what I can, and I, I, your numbers were wonderful, that there's been a tremendous increase in various uh, levels, maybe more on the federal level, perhaps on the state. But I will tell you on the local level, it's very, very difficult to encourage women to enter the field of law enforcement. And um, while those of us in the field encourage and try to mentor women, I wonder if there's anything on a national level or federal level we can do to encourage more women. We can probably all contribute to that one, but let me just start out a little bit. 20% of the United States Air Force today is women. 20%. 63,000 women serve in the United States Air Force, which 63,000 is more than the entire RAF and the Luftwaffe combined, by the way. Um, and they're all careers are open to them. And I remember 27 years ago, for the first time, so I graduated from the Air Force Academy in 1982, served as an officer in Europe during the Cold War. And for the first time in the first Gulf War, I remember our senior leaders, Colin Powell at the time and General Schwarzkopf, on national television, CNN was new. So that was gray hair, right? <laughs> Saying, uh, talking about our men and women in harm's way, our men and women in the, uni in the uniform. I had never been included in that way before. It was always before that our, our men in harm's way. And, and I remember just being absolutely struck by that, that I was on the team. I was part of something. Think about the most protective person you know in your life. 
the most the person who no matter what would keep you safe there's a lot of people in this room today who are thinking about their moms nobody we don't know anyone more protective than a mother's whose offspring is threatened if we want to talk about the protectors they're not all guys um, and, and those who seek to serve and protect others, who are called to serve, are, are welcome in the United States Air Force. I would only add that I don't, I don't think we talk as much as we might about these things, about the consistency of those values. Um, I think there are a lot of things between intelligence, the military, national service, local service, that are fundamentally about a higher purpose, doing things for a reason. A feeling of wanting to feel the weight of responsibility and to make a difference. Uh, I think we need to talk more about it. I think we need to go to more schools where you're at that point where you're trying to decide. I think we need to do more at the junior high, high school mix where people are trying to decide what they're going to become. I think any time we talk about it, it's inspiring to us. And I think we need to do a little bit more of not letting Hollywood be the purveyors of who we really are because I think if we talk about who we really are, and why we do it, and what we've been able to do, I think there is something fundamentally uh, consistent with the values um, of those protectors, of those achievers, of those aspirers, and I think we can do it. I do, Bonnie. Thank you, Jessica. <clears throat> well, first of all, uh, before I direct my question to uh, Secretary Wilson, I want to say how fantastic it is to, to be on stage uh, with all these other women, and particularly a female sheriff. Um, that, uh, you know, when I was running for Attorney General in Arkansas, and some of you all may have faced similar questions, uh, but they would ask me, they say, now, are you tough enough to do the job? And I would simply respond, let me tell you something, if a girl can get through junior high, she can do anything, so. Um, they, they really don't give us enough credit for those years. Um, so my question, uh, Madam Secretary, is uh, a, as you probably well know, uh, Arkansas and Little Rock Air Base, uh, any man or woman going through uh, the Air Force and working on piloting a C-130 uh, comes through Little Rock. As a matter of fact, I have here with me today the, the spouse of one of our C-130 pilots, uh, Amanda is here with me, and her, her husband just got transferred to La Rock Air Base, so now she's working with me, so I, it's a double bonus. But we love having uh, all those brave men, men and women there in Little Rock. They're uh, wonderful citizens. Uh, we want to have more than just our 7,000 active duty. We want to have more than just those 5,500 spouse uh, and family members. What can we do more, and what is the Air Force doing more and all of the armed forces to recruit and retain um, more folks to be at bases just like the Little Rock Air Base? Uh, the Air Force doesn't have a problem recruiting people. We have, uh, and uh, here's an interesting thing. Um, no one has ever been drafted into the United States Air Force. We're all volunteers. No woman has ever been drafted ever into the American military. Over two million women have served. Every single one of them has been a volunteer. Um, we do have a challenge today in retention, uh, particularly of pilots, but also maintainers, although that's getting a little better, and some of our cyber professionals as well. Uh, and uh, you know, the challenge is that the airlines are hiring. Uh, there's a mandatory retirement for airline pilots, and in order to fly for the airlines, you have to have 1,500 hours of flying time. And, uh, and it's hard to get that if you haven't, haven't been in the service. And so, so there's a tremendous demand out there. And I think one of the things we worry about, not only, not only for our C-130 pilots, but for everyone, is the high pace, uh, the high operational tempo that we have been asking our airmen to support over the last 27 years. Surge has become the new normal. And 
So you know, in a twenty in a in a in a four year assignment at Little Rock Air Base, you may be deployed twice for six months at a time. Your 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 temporary duty, even when you're home, you're not home, and and you get to the point where that's that balance. You love to serve. You've been called to serve. You feel as though you're doing something that matters in your life that's important, but you also have missed every you know every birthday this year, and and it's that balance that's um, really important to be able to retain. That means we've got to grow. We are too small for what the nation is asking of us and, and asking of our airmen and their families. And so that's why we've proposed a steady increase in the size of the service and a reduction of some of the dispiriting additional duties that airmen have to do when they're not deployed forward. But I guess the, uh, the you know, there's one other rule and that is that you recruit an airman and you retain a family. Um, and a little more focus on our families and what uh, and support for them um, by the communities in which they live would really matter a lot. And and I would say for those of you who are part of state legislat legislatures or uh, are, are active in your communities, there are two things that would help our families a lot. One is universal reciprocity and licensure for professional licensure for the spouses of those who are on active service. You know, if you can cut hair in New Mexico, my guess is you can probably do it well in Colorado without having to get relicensed. If you're a lawyer or an engineer or a CPA or a teacher or a nurse or an LPN and, and, and your husband or wife gets moved to the neighboring state, you should be able to continue to get a job. So, so universal recognition of licensure. And the second is the quality of the schools near our bases. There's nothing that makes you a base of choice more than having exceptional schools on or near our bases. Uh, an American airman is four times more likely to have a college degree than, than, uh, than the, the, um, uh, the population as a whole. They care a lot about the education of their children, and so that would make a difference. Good afternoon. Um, I uh, have a question about human trafficking. Um, we live in Iowa, which has the, you know, in the middle of the, the, at the capital, the intersection. I of grew AD. up in Pella. You do? Yeah. You did? So, oh, wow. I, Great. I, <laughs> but I, you know, a few years ago, we were, you know, Iowans were definitely, like, probably a lot of people in the country didn't think that human trafficking happened. But, you know, once again, our, our folks there are saying, well, the intersection of 80 and 35 cutting across the country. So the whole idea of, you know, kids being, but a lot of times at the local level, it's hard because they are they come from all over and they don't stay any place too long and they move on and just wanted to see if you have some ideas of how at the state and at the local level we can work with you. I'm so happy to hear that's a priority at the federal level. Yeah, we'd love, we'd love to talk with you directly about the issues you're seeing in Iowa. We have been working with state and local, not just law enforcement, but other state agencies around the country. I mean, I've, whenever I'm out in a, a field office or a new attorney's office somewhere, I, I tend to meet with the trafficking prosecutors there and oftentimes with state and local law enforcement. So I was in, uh, for example, Cincinnati a, a while back and met with the, the sheriff's office and the police department and, and other agencies. And, you know, in some places they have a great collaborative model where all the agencies are working together to find victims, figure out which is the right jurisdiction to prosecute the offender, figure out, you know, which, whether it's the Salvation Army or some local agency who can help the victim. Um, you know, other places don't have uh, as much of a focus on it. One thing that, that I've heard from law enforcement in several different places is that trafficking crimes are often not charged as trafficking crimes. They might be charged as a drug case or a gun case, which is easier to prove because you don't have to prove force, fraud, or coercion, you, you know. Um, and so sometimes if the numbers don't show up on the sheet of what got charged that year, the resources don't follow. And so getting, you know, increasing public awareness and public education about the prevalence of trafficking and the fact that it might be happening in your jurisdiction, even if you're DA in charge of a trafficking case that year, you know, that, that may help too. So, but we'd be happy to talk to you specifically about the issues that you're seeing. We have time for one more question. You know, we have a, a, a problem in, in America today and in my community and a lot of the other communities, and I'm sure the sheriff can attest to this, it's um, the lack of trust in our law enforcement. What can we do to 
encourage these communities to have more diversity so that their community of law enforcement looks like their actual community. It seems like people in general are more comfortable with people like them. So what can we do to encourage that? Well, I think you're right that public trust in, the, in law enforcement generally is extremely important to the effectiveness of law enforcement. I know many law enforcement agencies are very focused on, on diversity efforts for exactly the, the reasons you're talking about, and we're focused on that at the federal level as well. Uh, in addition to that, I think it's really, you know, it's hard to recruit to law enforcement agencies when they feel like they're under attack or that the public doesn't appreciate the, the work that they're doing. And so, you know, it, it may seem like a small thing, but I don't think it is. The Attorney General has really sent a message that we stand with law enforcement and we believe in, we believe that the overwhelming majority of law enforcement officers, state, local and federal, are keeping us safe every day and doing their jobs in, in good faith. At the same time, where there's a bad actor, we'll absolutely go after that person because you know what? Their bad actions undermine the integrity and the public perception of everybody else. But that does not mean we paint with a broad brush and, and say that all law enforcement are, are bad. So I, I think sending that message that, that law enforcement is an honorable profession, people believe in it, I mean, that will help recruit all people, I think, to go into law enforcement. With that, we are down to our final seconds, and uh, Kelly stressed that we keep this on time. So I want to thank all of our panelists. Thank you, our guests who are on stage with us, and let's give them a round of applause. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, as you know, my name is Kelly Sadler. You all have my email address. We incur if you'd like to get information about what we're doing, um, emails about what our priorities are, please let me know, and I'll include you on that list. Additionally, we encourage you all to tweet and share your stories about today. This is an ongoing series and we'll be having more of these uh, regularly moving forward throughout the year. So thank you so much for your time this afternoon.